Thank you for coming to our project briefing on expanding our research data services. Today you're going to hear two uh, academic library perspectives uh, about expanding research data services. First up, and I'm Brian Sinclair from Georgia State University Library. Um, uh, so uh, coming up first will be uh, Mandy Swigart hobaugh and, uh, and I uh, talking about um, um, uh, research data services at Georgia State. And then uh, Michelle Claiborne will follow us uh, in speaking uh, about, she's the Director of Research Data Services at University of Virginia Libraries. And we're talking about how they are expanding and working with campus networks to even uh, expand uh, research data services even further. So we'll go ahead and get started. Our portion is uh, more than data management plans, uh, exploring new outreach opportunities to expand research data services. Mandy is passing out a handout that we have been distributing on campus our number, she'll tell you more about it, but some of our services and personnel have expanded since that handout was created. So uh, first and foremost, or when we talk about uh, expanding research data services, at least in our culture, in our context, we're talking about data services, and we'll define that or get more into the details, uh, for all campus users. So the undergrad, the grad student, the postdoc, the staff member, the, the senior faculty member, we're talking about services for all uh, of those audiences, all of those potential users. Um, we are um, um, interested in understanding campus needs. Um, this involves often running ideas by our Student Library Advisory Council. Uh, this is their last meeting uh, last week. Uh, it's a smaller group because it was during finals. We run ideas by them. Uh, that's our Dean of Libraries and our Assessment Library and there, uh, Jennifer Jones. We offer uh, multiple focus groups and feedback stations in the library, and uh, most important for me is we do face-to-face uh, -face surveys, uh, man on the street, or in her case, woman on the street, interviews with students outside the library to find out what their needs are. So that kind of sets the stage. Um, so uh, for example, uh, in spring <coughs> 2015, uh, we, we conducted, we, the library, conducted a student technology needs survey. Uh, and. We did not lead the witness, uh, witnesses in this. We just said, what are your needs? What are your technology needs? What are your training needs, student? Uh, what are your resource needs? And the number one uh, response, or the number one need was Excel. Uh, and that was, we found that very interesting. We also surveyed our faculty and said, what's the number one training need that uh, your students need? And they said, Excel. And they also mentioned uh, several statistical software analysis tools like uh, Stata, SPSS, et cetera. But we did ask ourselves, what, where, what, what's the library's role here? And what the campus need is there, what's the library's role? So we also are attuned to the uh, research needs of our faculty, uh, not just that undergraduate student who needs help with Excel, uh, and supporting our research mission. We are a fairly new up and coming research university uh, research funding has, ex has grown 100% of the last five years. It's over $120 million a year and growing. It's on an upward tra trajectory. Uh, so that's important too. We have to keep, keep as, as we all do, uh, be mindful of our other res our, our researchers. Um, so in the 2013, 2012-2013 uh, school year, we did uh, establish a data management uh, advisory team. Um, and, and that was the big year, 2013, if you remember, the, the Office of Science and Technology uh, Policy issued its memorandum uh, that any federal agency uh, uh, o with over $100 million in an annual expenditures to develop, is to develop a plan to, to increase publicly funded research, data, journal articles as well. There was an executive order from President Obama. There were o OMB memos to the federal agencies about open data. So we uh, embrace that, as many of you who work in libraries may have with services. We specifically promoted the DMP tool. We worked through our office of uh, our, our research office, our VP for research, um, and he was very, very, very good meetings with the VP for research. Um, and we had some good business in that area. Uh, we we talked to about a dozen PIs, uh, mostly in the social sciences and humanities, and that continues to today: geosciences, uh, education. Um, anthropology, uh, et cetera. And, um, and, but I will say that um, business is not as robust as it was three or four year, three years ago. It is, it is, it is on the, the decline, and we're not sure why. So, but it is a service we provide. Now, in the last year, 20, in, this, in this, this, uh, this year, 2016, we, we have a new dean, uh, Jeff Steely, who came to us, and we have been involved in library strategic planning 
uh, and expanding research data services has been identified as a, as a strategic priority for our library. Um, so there are many uh, diagrams uh, illustrating the research uh, data life cycle or the research life cycle, and this is ours. It's a little bit smaller than most, right? <laughs> and, and, I, and Mandy uh, chaired the team that came up with this, and, and the ideas I'm going to be talking about are really Mandy's. Um, so uh, academic libraries in general uh, are well known for supporting an ex uh, the, ex the exploring and questioning uh, phase. That's the first one with the bin binoculars. So we've, and that's what we, what we have been describing recently is the little r of research. That's undergraduate research papers, assisting with lit reviews, et cetera. And many of us, like, like you and like us, um, uh, perhaps like you, um, have been uh, working with the sharing and documenting through the data management plans, data storage, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but we also see a need to support the big R phases of the research cycle. Um, and, and in which all levels of researchers, undergrad, grad, faculty, are designing and planning their research project, um, are it's finding existing data, exploring appropriate data analysis tools, where they're analyzing their data and creating their research outputs, cleaning up messy data, performing data analysis, creating data visualizations. There's been a real gap on our campus in support of these phases, the ones on the right, and the library seeks to fill that gap. So as we talk about expanding research data services, uh, it should be pointed out, pointed out, as I mentioned, we are a younger research uh, university. We, we were, uh, uh, in 1995, designated as a research inst institution in the state of Georgia by our, uh, by our uh, uh, university system. Um, uh, but we don't, because of that, we don't have nearly the political battles, turf wars, and institutional culture to fight. So if the library wants to recruit, hire, and expand services in GIS, or in social sciences data, or statistics, or even survey design, which is an increasing need, we don't normally run into a lot of turf wars or battles. There's a lot of teaching, learning, research support to go around, and most people welcome the library getting into this business. Um, so here's a digital sign in the library uh, that's advertising some of our many wor workshops that we did this last semester. Um, and you can see these aren't your typical library workshops. Maybe they are in your library. Uh, statistics in the real world, again, uh, Excel pivot tables was a key element of that. We were told this is something we want to know more about. Uh, using open refine to clean your data. Uh, finding data sets in ICPSR. Uh, uh, for mapping workshops, uh, both getting into the weeds with GIS and, and then also just how to create a map um, for, your, for your research paper. And. Um, So again, what, what may set us apart uh, is that we strive to collaborate with all researchers, as I've said, including the undergrad, who are typically underserved in the growing and critical areas of data science. We believe that data literacy goes hand in hand with information literacy and digital literacy, and that there are training and consultation needs we've only begun to tap into. And this is one of our GRAs actually giving one of her uh, popular Tableau workshops in the library recently. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mandy, who will continue talking about Georgia State. All right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so I am the team leader or interim team leader because I'm trying it out for a year and deciding if it's going to give me a, you know, a heartburn. I already have heartburn. More heartburn <laughs> than I already have. I'm the interim team leader for research data services. So, let me make sure I know how to operate this. Okay, so these are general areas of um, data services. And some of you who came in a later might not have a flyer, but those of you who um, did get in here sooner, <laughs> when we still had flyers to pass out, we have this flyer that gives kind of the details of in these general areas, what types of specific tools, um, or services we provide and actually there's also a um, <coughs> web address on there that if you go to our, our web address you'll get um, more details about this and actually since this flyer was printed we've recently added a digital scholarship librarian who he has skills that overlap with data services as well so I immediately harangued him into putting his initials on these and saying he would provide services I didn't give him much time so who is providing these services 
Um, well, we have librarians providing these services, and then we also have um, grad students providing some of the services. And for the librarians, this is a great opportunity because it's helping us expand our roles and kind of grow professionally. And for the grads, it's a great opportunity for them because it is going to make them more marketable to be able to say that they've done these things. How we're providing our services, um, we offer drop-in help as well as scheduled consults and then we have some open workshops like the ones that Brian showed that were advertised on those digital signs but we also do custom workshops for people if they um, need those we work with classes custom um, do custom sessions for them so an example from this semester that it was a kind of a nice organic way of helping I use the word organic <laughs> I'm having organic way of helping people was we were doing drop-in assistance hours for SPSS help and we had several undergraduate students from the same statistics class in sociology coming to ask for assistance and we were able to figure out who the instructor was which it was a graduate instructor and I'm also the sociology librarian so I knew her and, I, and she's my Facebook friend and I said hey Stephanie we get a lot of students in here needing help with SPSS wondering do you need a classroom with a computer lab with computers that you could come in and we could float around and troubleshoot with you of helping them do that and she said that would be great and we ended up doing four sessions that way so it was a nice way to um, illustrate that we really try to work for custom and on-demand needs of our users um, generally our website these are some snapshots of our website so we have our people who are providing the services, their little initial bubbles that our graphic designer in the library made for us, that if you click on those, you will automatically send an email to somebody. Um, we list again all our different services that we provide. And again, we have the little initial bubbles so people know exactly who they can contact. If they click on that, they can send a direct email to those people. We included a little feedback box on there that I know it's kind of hard to see from here but people can give feedback on the workshops, give feedback on individual consultations, or just share ideas with us in general of what they want to see for future data services. And then we have a calendar that lists exactly when our drop-in hours are and when workshops are that you can filter to. If you're looking specifically for somebody's specific drop-in hours, you can find them and so on. Um, you, the flyer that you have, again, we, had, we developed this flyer that was distributed by PDF to all the deans on campus. I think our library dean, Jeff Steely, sent it to them, and it trickled down through the departments. I know for a fact that the sociology department chair sent it to his grad listserv and his faculty listserv because I'm on those. <laughs> so I'm interloping and know that it made its way down. Um, we also provide a PDF of this to another entity on campus that's through our IT department that does provide some training workshops on things like Excel and SPSS and we are working closely with them so we don't necessarily duplicate each other but that we complement each other and also they don't have the capacity to provide one-on-one -on -one consultations so they really depend on and refer to us to say you know oh you need a one-on-one -on -one cons -on -one consultation go see this person contact this person um, we also asked our liaison librarians to forward information about the services to various departments including the PDF of the flyer but we also combed the class schedule and we're doing this again for next semester combed the schedule looking for specific classes to contact those instructors to do targeted marketing towards them regarding specific workshops or services so for example for the statistics in the real world um, workshop I contacted all the statistics instructors on campus and said hey this might be something your students are interested in please consider letting them know about it and I know that some people did forward that on All right, next. that's me <laughs> on the screen and a, a couple weeks ago literally a couple weeks ago we gave an overview of our services to the deans of the various colleges and schools 
Um, asking them to actively promote the services again. I mean, they had sent the PDF flyer at the beginning of the semester, but it's always good to keep telling people about our services. But to also ask them, you know, what, what can you tell us? What input can you give us to help us improve our services? Um, at this meeting, I also distributed a handout that's printed on the back of your your handout, so it's double sided. <laughs> um, and on the back, we distributed it to the, the deans to give them a sense of the great work we've been doing so far. Again, we really just rolled this program out in July or for this semester. So even so far, you know, we gave them some of our numbers about our consults, but we gave them some good stories, some little snippets of how we've helped people. So I shared the fact about that SPSS class that we, we held because of recognizing a direct need for that. Um, and in terms of assessment, in addition to evaluation of workshops and individual consults, et cetera, where every year roughly we're hoping to try to collect at least like 10 good stories or success stories could have more like um, anecdotal or kind of testimonials in some way. So this handout is kind of a good start towards that. And recently our, um, I think this is the research computing team, which is through the research, University Research Services and Administration or the research office on campus, they are, have included a link to our webpage for help on data service and support. And they, they're very supportive of us. I know, like what Brian said, we don't t tend to have turf wars. I'm going to be a little more cynical <laughs> and say we don't have turf wars because they don't want to do it. <laughs> or they don't want to do it. Or they don't have the resources to do it. So they're perfectly happy to be like, oh, look, the library will do all these things for you. Get out of our face. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I see it more. But I probably should have put that on the Q&A. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it back over to Brian. Okay, so and we I can kind of wrap us up. We're going to wrap it up real quick because Michelle, we want to get to Michelle. And, and if you could just save your questions um, for after Michelle's presentation, we hope to leave some time to have a dialogue with you about some of this because you probably have questions. So what's next for us? And this, I need to, I need to hit a bunch of points real fast because I need to get turn it over to Michelle. Um, and oh, and by the way, when, when we get to the Q and A time at the end, that's not recorded, so we can have some real discussion here. You can be cynical. I'm very positive. I'm very optimistic. <laughs> and if you want to be cynical, that's good too. So um, anyway, so our, what's next? Let me talk about our reachable, the low hanging fruit, the reachables for us right now. This is stuff we're actually doing. So we're, we're going to do more focus groups with faculty and grad students, uh, targeting faculty specifically, as Mandy said, going combing those those catalogs and finding out where these classes are and targeting faculty more specifically. Um, uh, continued partnerships with our research computing and the VP for research office. Now there's two types of data, we haven't talked about data storage yet, that's a whole other presentation, uh, but I should say there's two types of data storage we work with primarily, that's your working data storage, the collaborative space where you can do your work with your fellow researchers, colleagues, grad students, students, and then there's the long-term data preservation, right? So I would say most of our questions that I've, and anecdotally, I don't have any data, have been more the working. I need a collaborative space to store my data and work with my team. And we are working with research solutions. They have identified, and you, someone in this room may know more about this, Dropbox for Business as a possible thing that the library might help with to support faculty. We are told it's HIPAA, FERPA, et cetera, compliant. So Dropbox for Business may be our next kind of uh, foray into this. Uh, and of course, OSF for institute, OSF, things like that for long-term preservation. We have already had meetings with research computing. That is a big, big uh, push from the library, but we must work with our research computing office on, on some of those initiatives. Um, but they are in the works. Um, harder to reach, but there is commitment from, I'm administration, so there's commitment, Mandy. There's commitment. Um, so um, I'm not a, I like the 10 good stories that Mandy talked about. I'm a more anecdotal, qualitative person, but we need a quantitative expert. We need, not, we need to hire a quantitative expert in our library, uh, specifically for statistical consulting and data cleaning. That, that's, that is a big, when we talk about data management, faculty say, oh, you can help me clean my data. No, we're, we're not using the same language, but we need someone who's a data cleaning person. Um, more expertise in survey design, specifically in use of Qualtrics, uh, and, and there's commitment there. Uh, increased staffing and GIS support, 
uh, specifically someone who can get more in depth with our ESRI license and all those moving pieces if you're familiar with that. Uh, secure physical and virtual spaces for work working with restricted data. We have this great space in our library called Curve. It's very open, but if you're dealing with restricted use data or more pr need to be more private, it's a terrible place. So we need to find a place for those researchers to work with that type of data set. And then consultation in writing things other than DM, uh, data management plans. So for example, uh, an RB proposal using restricted data, like I mentioned, we could help with that. That's something like, we, we understand the, some of the uh, boilerplate. So with no further ado, save your questions. We appreciate your attention. Michelle is going to talk, and then hopefully we'll have some dialogue toward the end. Awesome. Um, so I'm Michelle Claiborne. I'm the Director of Research Data Services at the University of Virginia Library. And um, I use this metaphor of the TARDIS. If you're not Doctor Who fans, I apologize. You're going to have a long 15 or 20 minutes as I have Doctor Who quotes for you each time. Um, but, you know, it's kind of my current metaphor for the networks and partnerships that we've been building with our research support partners throughout the university. Um, and with the idea that by entering in any of those ways, right, through any of those partnerships, through any of those doors, the hope is researchers gain access to a distributed set of research expertise and resources, making us all appear kind of bigger on the inside, um, like Doctor Who's beloved time-traveling police box. Um, so today I want to tell you a little bit more about those networks and the initiatives they've helped produce, and as well some of the challenges or barriers that we've encountered. So, we just hit the. Oh, that oh, worked too. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so, again, um, I want to let you just know what research data services means at our library right now. Um, and the library established this unit that we call research data services only in October of 2013, <laughs> merging together sort of for some longer term and some new services that we were creating, including our oldest, our three-year-old at the time, data management consulting group who had done a lot of great early work advocating for and advising on data management planning and sharing, archiving and curation. And then we also at that time had a newly created stat lab uh, which provides consultations, training and support for data analysis, visualization, wrangling and statistical computation. We also had a newly hired uh, data librarian providing uh, data discovery expertise and working with researchers to locate data and to build the library's data collections. And at this point, we also um, adopted, in some ways, uh, our research support software support group that had formerly been housed in the Information Technology Main IT Center at, at UVA. Um, so they became part of the library, and their role is really about helping researchers locate, access, and install the site license software, research software titles available to them. So this kind of all came together and we became Research Data Services. So our work in the first three years has focused on a few activities across all these services, um, including consultations and collaborations with researchers, education and training for data intensive research approaches. And I'm gonna briefly talk about some of those and then get on to the other one, which is really about the building of partnerships and programs within the university to promote data, computational and quantitative research across our campus. So uh, the summer of 2016, I, we had existed for three years, and I thought that was a great time to pull all our data about what we'd been doing and send it up the, train, up the line, right? <laughs> um, and so the advent of, of RDS as a combined unit, I think, really helped situate the library more centrally in the research process, particularly of our quantitatively and computationally oriented scholars. So one of our key, one of our primary activities is this direct engagement with researchers through our consultations and collaborations. And so in our first three years, we hosted nearly 1,800 consultations with researchers. The majority of those actually did center around data analysis, wrangling, and statistics, about 60% of them. Um, so I checked, I, last night I looked at our, our forms and we have another 375 records from this fall that, I, that aren't represented here and I haven't broken them down yet. Um, but I was like, whew, I'm pretty excited about that, actually. Um, our consultations, I'm particularly excited that our consultations really reach across 
the entire university. So through the summer of 2016, we'd met with about 800 different researchers because, we, because about 45% of our 45% well, of our researchers meet with, the, meet with multiple of us or meet with us repeatedly, right? Which in my sign is, a, I mean, I think that's a really great sign that they're coming back or they're cross-referencing and we're able to kind of bring some, most people come through the stat lab and we're able to say, hey, you know, you should talk to our data discovery person or hey, you should talk to our, our data management folks, right? And it's able to cross-reference and people come back. And I think that's um, a marker of the value they ascribe to the work we do. Um, <clears throat> But also, we've reached all 11 schools. I got off track. All 11 schools, like we have 11 schools at UVA, and we've worked with people in all of them, right? And um, I think that, again, makes me really proud of the work the team does, um, that we've managed to kind of touch at some level, some more than others. The College of Arts and Sciences, which is that top one, is the biggest one. That's all of our humanities, social sciences, and sciences. So that weighs everything. But that we've made connections. Um, across the campus. And we've worked with researchers at all levels, right? From novice undergraduate researchers to expert faculty researchers, or sometimes novice faculty researchers when they're entering a new domain, right? We've um, kind of run the gamut in that way. The bulk of our engagement, though, is with graduate students. And about 45% of uh, the folks that we've worked with are grad students, which is a community we explicitly targeted um, early on. So in these kind of collaborations or consultations, we do all sorts of things, right? That's represented by, represented by our service. We, and just to give a few illustrations, and I need to put these together in a, I love, I love Mandy's flyer, so I'll work on that. We worked with a business faculty to reshape his experimental data and implement a multi-level model to estimate treatment effects for a repeated measures design, right? Something he was told to do by a reviewer but didn't quite know how to do, right? We worked with an interdisciplinary team of faculty to draft a data management plan for an NSF sustainability research network proposal, um, which was more challenging than most because it was so interdisciplinary, nobody wanted to, you know, it wasn't just one faculty, it was like, oh, there's 10. <laughs> Who's gonna take that, you know, Hurting that down. potato, right? <laughs> and so that one was when I think we did a, a lot more work than we might normally have done. We consulted repeatedly with a politics faculty member who was trying to acquire some key international time series data that he needed to finish his book. Right? And, um, and we were able to help them get that. And we worked with our Office of Institutional Assessment to help automate their survey reports by helping them write reproducible scripts um, and, and make their work more efficient. And so we've kind of, again, that's just to say we have a variety of services and a variety of different kinds of users we've interacted with. The second kind of big effort we've made is in our workshops and our training programs. So, we, you know, we're a library and education is a core mission. So we've been developing our workshop, workshop series. And to me, what we see is sort of a really, the, the widest, widespread knowledge needs, right? We've tried to hit the things that many, many people um, have been asking about. And so, but particularly around data and computational skills. <coughs> and particularly the kinds of, the hidden knowledge. Those things that people think you know, but nobody teaches and it's not part of any formal curriculum. That's really, the, you know, for us, the sweet spot. So we don't intend these to be substitutes for departmental curricula. Um, that's something I had to explain to some faculty and some departments mm -hmm. a couple of times, right? <laughs> but in fact, to be co to complement those things, right? Providing a pool of collective resources from research where researchers in any field could draw from. Um, so in the first three years, we've offered 90 workshops open to the whole community, including people outside the community who sometimes come, um, for which we had nearly 1,900 learners registered the workshop offerings, again, range from introduction to common analysis environments, the introductions to R, visualizing it with ggplot in R, or Stata, or SPSS, or SAS, um, all the way up to sort of advanced statistical methods. So we offer things like multiple imputation for missing data, or machine learning, right, introductions to these things as well. As well as computation and sort of programming approaches, we work, we have uh, workshops on Python, uh, interfacing with APIs, getting accustomed to the command line, um, and things like that. Oh, I sh that was an ending clause when I should have not ended yet, as well as research data management workshops where we do data management planning, as well as things like introduction to database design and sort of getting people familiar with other sorts of tools. So we've been working to build uh, kind of new efficiencies as well by recruiting experts from across our campus and providing them a ready-made platform to share their knowledge. So I, I go around, anytime I meet somebody, I'm like, you know cool stuff. I say, hey, would you like to do a workshop on that? And it's surprising how often they say yes, right? Because all they have to do is prepare the thing and show up, and I've got this whole system 
right, that they can just walk into. And increasingly, I realize that's actually a valuable resource in itself, right? Even if the experts are in the library, having kind of a thing that they don't have to do any logistics for um, makes them so much more willing to come and share their knowledge with our, camp with our users and our campus. Um, oh, and the word cloud, just so you know, I should probably say what that is. That's a word cloud of all our workshop titles um, with the size tied to the number of registered users, registrants for the, for the workshop. So you can see that R is a big thing for us. Um, but these workshops, too, have proven a, a university-wide resource, and they've drawn interest from across campus with, again, researchers coming from all 11 schools and several additional centers. Again, graduate students are our modal user, about 60% um, who come to the workshops are graduate students. But it's across, it runs the gamut from faculty to undergrads to research staff to um, other staff. So this is kind of what we spent a lot of time on in our first three years, as well as partnerships. But there was a lot going on at the university that really uh, catalyzed some of the partnership work we wanted to do. Um, so there was a lot changing on campus all around the same time. And here I'm going to highlight just a few of those things that really altered our context in ways that we were able to leverage. One was that UVA established uh, data science institutes. This is the first of several planned pan-university institutes. Um, and the, D the DSI, right, as we call it, was really there to kind of be a hub of data science activity on, on campus. And they also provide a master's program, a master's in data science program. <coughs> We also hired a new VP for IT uh, with an emphasis on academic computing. So our IT, central IT department, had um, become increasingly focused on enterprise systems, something that Cliff kind of referenced in the opening remarks as well. And we, we, we've been hearing for a while from a lot of researchers that they felt like the university at large had been neglecting the needs of more academic computing, the things that weren't generalized and universal for everybody that needed special systems. And so his, one of his charges was to do that. So we suddenly had someone at a high level with interest um, in the university. The School of Medicine and the health system is, is a big part of our university. The School of Medicine just hired their first director of research computing, which sort of marked a growing interest and investment on their part, which again, if you have a medical school and a health system, like that's a big influencer of the university at large. And then UVA also spent about five million dollars across two different high-end computing platforms. Uh, we purchased a couple years ago uh, a much better uh, HPC cluster than we had previously had called Ravana and then more recently uh, something we call Ivy which is a secure compute environment for protected data and so it was meant to really make the people who had to work with HIPAA, FERPA data in a compute environment not just storage but where the compute and the storage are together it was meant to meet that need. And so we had new systems in place, new people in place, and that really provided us quite a few opportunities you know, to move forward in, in new ways. So at the onset of the Data Science Institute, um, the new director approached the library about bringing me on board in a partial appointment as the first associ associate director, and my charge was data services and infrastructure, um, which I felt like I was kind of doing anyway from the library point of view, but it gave me a different platform to do it. Um, which was kind of fun and interesting. Although if you ever do those partial appointments, you know it's not really, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> nothing else went away, right? You just <laughs> add more. Um, but I, it was a great chance for us to build some really enduring bridges with this new institute for, around which there was a lot of excitement on grounds, on campus. We call it grounds, I'm sorry. Keep trying to correct that. Um, and so we've done things like, you know, work with them on delivering boot camps to their students. They've worked with us on resourcing workshops and boot camps that we, where we bring in outside experts like Software Carpentry or the Center for Open Science. And we just, in fact, one thing I'm really excited about, we've just finished a two-year pilot um, between, that was a partnership between the library and the Data Science Institute where the library staff offered one credit short courses because our library can't offer credit. Um, we offered one credit short courses through the Data Science Institute, so open to all learners. So Anyone across the university could take a class where they got credit for things like data wrangling in R, or text is data, or applied causal inference, or data wrangling in Python with a four we've done so far. Um, which both helped us have a new platform because we've been working on how could we, you know, the main question after our workshops is how could I learn more? Um, 
I have answers to that that I'll say for Q&A, but this was one opportunity. Like, well, here's a way of doing it where you feel like it's not just extra. Um, it's not just an add-on. And it also helped meet the need of the Data Science Institute, who has spent most of its curricular time on developing their master's program, which isn't open to anybody besides their students, right? And so people are like, hey, what are you doing for us? Another opportunity between all, while this stuff was changing was created again by the new VPIT. So our unit in the library had been working to build relationships with colleagues in a complementary unit called Advanced Research Computing Services, which is the, the computational experts that really support the HPC platform. Um, we'd been meeting them regularly and trying to kind of figure out how we might work better together. But this new environment, and particularly the new VPIT, gave those efforts a really big boost. Um, so the VPIT kind of took on the long recognized need to bring together related research support efforts that were spread all around grounds um, campus to help our community discover these disparate experts. So recently these networks have been formalized into cadre. So this is a, a screenshot of our web, over to the right, of our web, new web page, um, the Computational and Data Resource Exchange, which is a partnership of research data, well, of all these groups, research data services, um, our advanced research computing services, the BPIT's office, the Data Science Institute, our central ITS's um, research cyber infrastructure group, uh, our health sciences library and their bioconnector efforts and our school of medicine research computing. So I have room for everything. So there's a I'll spell out the acronyms in person. Um, we, you know, we all came together and you know, had 15 people at a table over many months where we jointly designed a web page, which is fun. Um, <laughs> but there it is. And so we finally got it done and it was really exciting. Um, and I, and part of what, you know, the benefit is having is to answer that question that researchers say is like, why can't I find it all in one place? That's what we're really trying to do here. Um, the webpage is linked to from all the partners' websites. And again, the hope is that there are all sorts of portals on which you might come through to find a central place where you can find, it. eventually, I'm sure not everything yet, but eventually everything that we can come up with that would be a resource, particularly of interest to computationally data-oriented researchers. Um, so that's, that actually is, <laughs> On the one hand, it's just a web page, but it represents a really big success and a lot of effort, and I'm really proud of it, actually. Um, and the cadre effort in general, and we meet regularly, has been a great vehicle for bringing many of the dyadic partnerships that we already had into one big unit, right? So we already worked with most of these people in, in sort of that, you know, just between ourselves, um, and this kind of brought it all together. So a key goal of this effort is to improve coordination and exposure of data and computationally oriented infrastructure training and expertise. Um, and just this, um, after we've launched this page, we've started inviting, now that we have something, we've started inviting new folks in to be part of the group, um, including uh, a new legal what, empirical, what's it called, legal empirical lab, something like that. It's the data folks in the law school. Um, and a visualization lab in the architecture school. And our digital humanities efforts in our, from our colleagues down the hall in the library's uh, scholars lab, right? I've been trying to get them kind of involved to make the network bigger. <clears throat> so we've had a lot of new partnerships and programs that began to actually result, began to develop, excuse me, even as a result of this, right? This big group of people meeting regularly and now it offered new things. Many of them still dyadic, but things that might not have happened otherwise, um, including we began working more closely with the VPR's office, our Vice President for Researchers office this fall, on funding discovery. They recently licensed some funding discovery tools. They don't have the capacity to sort of help users with them, and we said, hey, we're librarians, we'll do it, right? You want us to have, a, you want to help them find a, make a query that's gonna get them good results on a weekly basis? Yeah, I think that's probably right in their skill set. And it's a great new way for us to kind of interact with our research community. We've worked with the VPR's office and the Center for Open Science um, on, Getting into the OSF for institutions world, we have a UVA branded OSF page now. And so we've been part of these groups kind of bringing these things on board in ways I'm not entirely sure, probably maybe they would have happened anyway, but I feel like it was all much smoother because of these efforts. Um, and there's others, but I'll, I'll stop there. Oh no, I do want to say a couple more actually. There was, I know, so I see this is why I wrote it down. Um, I, to be honest, I feel like our RDS work with our own colleagues and our thriving DH community has really spun up more because of because of these broader networks, and we've been able to do more to connect that vibrant work with our science and engineering groups, for instance, in a way that I maybe was a little bit disconnected before. <laughs> and having kind of 
sort of have feeling like you got partners, right? It just makes things easier. Um, so our RDS group uh, sponsored the first UVAR meetup in Virginia. Um, and we have a monthly meeting with like 400, not 400 people don't come, but 400 people are on the meetup page. Um, and it's really fun, right? And it was easier to do because we knew we had people that would be, would have our back on it. Um, the, our library, RDS, sponsored the first, um, the inaugural Data Fest at UVA, which is an American Statistical Association program that's the 72 hour data hackathon style data challenge for undergraduates. In, in part because we actually feel like we weren't targeting undergraduates very well and so we wanted to do something, but also it was really easy to get partners and funding um, from about seven different partners for that event, which was a really big deal. And having this kind of backing, having this kind of network, again, really facilitated those efforts. So it has not been without downsides, though, right? All of this integration and partnership has presented challenges, some expected, and a few that you know, in retrospect, seem entirely predictable, but I hadn't anticipated in advance. Um, and so among the expected things, and I won't spend much time on this, so we can have time for conversation, you know, of course, are time constraints, right? Maintaining relationships with seven, eight new partners, it's time consuming. I'm surprised at how much time it takes. Um, there's staff constraints, right? As we expand into new areas, we have a lot more people saying, hey, maybe the library would like to be part of this, and we want to say yes. <laughs> And yet we don't actually have more people. And so we have to be really, really vigilant about shifting work instead of just adding to it. And that's, you know, it's, you, you guys know that's hard, right? Um, and there have been a few cultural collisions, right? Not all of our partners have the same expectations or practice of sharing information or, frankly, of sharing credit, right? And so these are things we have to kind of continue to work through. And, the, and, that, and that credit part kind of matters um, <laughs> because of of an, an one of the unexpected challenges that I'll get to, which was this, that partnerships, you know, they diffuse responsibility. We kind of, that's predictable. That has reasonably predictable consequences. Things like, you don't have the same time horizons, right? Not everybody's willing to work on things. I'm not entirely sure how easy it's gonna be to sustain a web page maintained by seven different units, right? I guess we'll see. <clears throat> but what I was less sort of prepared for was the diffused credit or recognition. And so while our institution regularly voices the desire for more partnerships and coordination to help leverage dispersed resources, it's not in fact how our budgets work. Our budgets are by separate units. And not everybody, you know, there are people of different power in these partnerships and some people have more power to advocate and claim credit and get resources for their unit than others. And it's, it's just asymmetric, right? And that's not something I had really planned for. Um, and it's one of those roles where I think library leadership really has to be involved, precisely because of those things. It's also problematic because our users don't always know where help is coming from when they come through these other systems, which is fine for them, but we also have a new budget model where chairs and departments are being given a list of exactly how much of their budget is being apportioned out to central services like IT and the library and ARCs and things like that. And so they're seeing that. And so on that point, really does, we really do want them to connect it to us in a way that the partnerships, frankly, make slightly harder. Um, and secondly, the partnerships kind of obscure resource needs, right? Be precisely because multiple partnerships, networks, and collaborative programs make a team look bigger, which I'm gonna sell as largely a benefit, um, it can make it harder for administrators to see the insufficiencies in support, right? They have a list that five people are on this team. It's not necessarily clear that only 5% of any of those people's time is actually on this project. And so it looks like things are better resourced than they are. Um, and maybe less benignly, <coughs> it gives them cover for insufficient resourcing. So that one's bitten us in a way that I'm happy to elaborate on in Q&A a little bit. Um, but in general, this call to be dynamic and responsive, um, which we're all trying really hard to do, makes the kind of formal institutions we normally rely on to guard against these things like MOUs and sort of written arrangements just a lot less practical, right, when you're trying to be nimble. And so we think we really need library leadership involved in a pretty direct way at, you know, in some of these conversations to guard against these things. So before I end, um, this is just a picture of the team, my research data services team. So I wanted to give you a sense of what we have. So while RDS was developing, our library also went through a reorganization in the summer of 2015 where the RDS team became part uh, and the social natural engineering science liaison team got merged. So I'm actually director of research data sciences and social natural engineering sciences. 
Um, so we're responsible for data services as well as liaison work with the social natural engineering science departments at UVA, which is a pretty big population. But one of the things this has allowed us to do is seriously cross-pollinate so that most of the data service experts now liaison with the department as well, which gives them kind of insight sometimes into that, to that work. And most of our uh, library uh, liaison experts kind of do, I've been coming into our data services efforts as well, helping research with data management plans, helping with data discovery in particular. And I think that cross-pollination has been really effective. We're a really mixed bunch, so I just kind of added um, backgrounds a little bit from the group. Um, so I, I'm gonna, I would argue, if, if you push me, that that mix is one of our biggest assets. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that later, but now I'm gonna end by saying just a few things that are coming, coming down the pipe for us because we are nimble and responsive and things continue to change, right? Um, so some of the things we're working on now, and I would love any kind of eye conversation or feedback or suggestions about any of these things, is that you know, we're still working on integrating these teams, the RDS and the Social Natural Engineering Sciences. Um, RDS to date has had no identifiable space our technologies, we just have our offices. And so one of the conversations that's just begun is whether we could have some sort of welcoming storefront place for, for our work and some new technologies we're uh, acquiring. And because, I would say one of the benefits of the, there are many benefits to the integration of the teams, but one of them is that it's really started a conversation within our group about efforts to better support qualitative research in addition to quantitative research. And that's been really driven by the social science librarians um, in a way that I'm not sure we would have even started down on our own. And finally, we're taking some first steps into our own internally developed projects. Most of the work we do is very responsive to the research community. And um, we've got, we're starting, we're starting our Data for Democracy Lab. I'm very excited about it, but I'm not gonna, it's new and I, I'm not sure there's much to tell you yet, other than the idea is to pull streams of information about the presidency together, and extract yeah. features from it in a weekly basis so we can kind of all know what's being said in different can't imagine outlets. what I know. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so that's kind of an exciting initiative. And now I'm going to stop because I've gone over. I apologize. <laughs> so, so we, uh, as, as you can tell, we're very, at Georgia State, we've been, we're in our fourth month, right, of doing this. And I thought that was a very, that was very, very enlightening, Michelle. Thank you. So do you have questions for us? Well, it's time. I hate this, but if, if you um, would like to reach out to any of us and or have a conversation, we'd love to talk to you more about staffing and burnout and maybe <laughs> new roles for librarians and all those things and new roles for our, you know what kind of boundary skills. We, yes, boundary <laughs> negotiation. Uh, but anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>